Today at 12 p.m. Eastern over on Jawgator 7, a new baseball video will drop. In this video, we'll talk about a bizarre incident involving the Boston Red Sox during the 1970s and how they cost one of their players the batting title because of something stupid that they did. Click the card in the upper right corner to join the channel now. And now, on with our feature presentation. You know this play. Roll the tape. Levitri with a nice block at the guard. Going deep. He's got Johnson! Oh, he dropped the ball! Yep. Hard to believe that was 13 years ago already. You remember exactly when this happened and where you were when Stevie Johnson, with the game on the line in overtime, dropped the game-winning touchdown pass that would have beaten the Pittsburgh Steelers. One of the most infamous drops in NFL history. If Johnson catches this pass, the Steelers lose the game. They end the year at 11-5, and, and they wind up losing the division and a first-round bye, as they make it as a wild card instead, completely changing the complexion of the entire 2010 season. The crazy part was that Johnson was actually not that bad of a receiver. He had three straight seasons with Buffalo, with over a thousand yards receiving. But all anyone can remember about Johnson's career is this infamous drop. I can't really blame you if you can't think of anything else besides that. And if you remember the drop, aside from the fact that it was ugly, you probably remember what happened after the game, when Johnson, who dropped five passes on this day, had a rather bizarre explanation for what transpired. He didn't blame himself. Rather, he blamed the man upstairs. He blamed God. All that praise was for nothing. It was one of the most bizarre moments and rants in Bill's history for a reason. And it's not hard to see why, considering the circumstances. But let's be real. There have been tons of videos and articles about that drop and the rant afterwards. So that's not what this video is about. Not at all. I brought that up because this was not the first time that God has looked the other way on the Bills when they were playing. This isn't the first time that the Bills and God have gotten into it. Because while you probably know about the Stevie Johnson incident, in all likelihood, you don't know about what transpired nearly 20 years before that, when a Monday Night Football loss was so controversial for some reason, and so alarmingly bad, that a citywide outrage and debate broke out about whether God was truly on Buffalo's side, to the point where just about every church in the area had to get involved. No, I am not exaggerating. I am not making any of this up. This is the crazy story of the bizarre rivalry in 1991 between the Buffalo Bills and God. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question and the church's reaction to all of this, we need some context to understand how the game in question was going that caused Buffalo to lose its faith. It's October 6, 1991. It's week six of the NFL season, and we've got a matchup in the AFC on our hands at Arrowhead Stadium under the lights on Monday Night Football on ABC between the Buffalo Bills, coached by Marv Levy, and his former team, the Kansas City Chiefs. Aside from the fact that this was Buffalo's first appearance on ABC since the heartbreak that transpired 10 months before at Super Bowl 25. This was an absolutely monumental game, and was one of the more anticipated games of the season for a reason, especially since it was in front of a national television audience. Buffalo entered this game at 5-0, as the lone unbeaten in the AFC, and as one of just three unbeatens left in football, alongside Washington and New Orleans. Thanks to a dominant offense that was number one in the AFC by averaging 32.4 points per game, and had the highest scoring average in the entire NFL entering this game, they were picking up right where they left off from their AFC Champion campaign the year before. Win this game, and you've got quite the cushion on the rest of the division for a fourth consecutive division title, as well as a nice cushion on more than a game for the number one seed and home field advantage. As for Kansas City, they enter at 3-2, and two. So a win here would put them tied with the Denver Broncos for first place in the AFC West, while a loss would put them in a logjam with a bunch of teams for a wildcard spot, especially since there were five other teams with three wins by this point. This game was a big one. 
where the Bills, who were looking like an unstoppable freight train, finally meet their match under the lights? Well, the answer to that question, unfortunately for Buffalo, was a resounding yes. This was the first Monday Night Football game at Arrowhead since 1985, and even though it had been a while, with the way Kansas City played on this day, it was worth the wait. As when all was said and done, the Chiefs absolutely destroyed the Bills, taking it by a final score of 33-6. Buffalo was a slight favorite entering the game, as Vegas had them as three-point favorites to keep their hot, undefeated start alive. But no one, and I truly mean no one, saw a rout of this magnitude and a blowout of this nature coming. Kansas City led from start to finish. As you could tell from the onset, after the opening kickoff got taken past midfield following a late hit by Buffalo, that this was just going to be one of those nights where everything went right for Kansas City and everything went wrong for the Bills. And even though it was close in the second quarter, Kansas City scored the final 23 points of the game and forced Buffalo, the number one offense in football, and an offense that was turning the ball over twice per game on average, to turn the ball over five times and score no points in the second half. Whatever stat you want to use, Kansas City was the clear winner. Buffalo's offensive line had no answer for Kansas City, as not only did the Chiefs finish the game with six sacks, but eventual Pro Football Hall of Famer Derek Thomas had four sacks, having arguably the best non-1990 game against the Seahawks performance of his career. Kansas City dominated in the time of possession, as the Bills' defense could not get off the field no matter how hard they tried. The Chiefs had over 44 minutes of possession, meaning that for every one minute that Buffalo held the ball, Kansas City held it for three minutes. Buffalo went just two for seven on third down, converting on only 28% of their attempts, while Kansas City went 11 for 17, converting 65% of their attempts, and going on slow, long, sustained, methodical drives in the process. The Chiefs nearly doubled the Bills' total yardage, winning that battle 389 to 211. The Chiefs had roughly two and a half times the number of first downs that the Bills had, winning that battle 26 to 11. And the offensive line not only kept starting quarterback Steve DeBerg clean by not giving up any sacks, but helped multiple players on the team run for over 100 yards, with Harvey Williams and Krishna Koye both crossing the 100-yard barrier. In other words, this game was a complete massacre and was the first time in what felt like forever that the Bills truly laid an egg. For the dominant force of the AFC for the early part of the 90s, this truly was a shock. And if that was the end of the story, then let's be honest, there's not a lot here. It's a shocking result in what turned out to be another successful season for the Bills. It's a super fond memory for Chiefs fans, and it's a memorable return to Arrowhead for Monday Night Football that wouldn't necessarily matter three months later when the Bills and Chiefs played again in the divisional round of the playoffs, and this time, the Bills had the upper hand, and won that one convincingly by a final score of 37-14. But as you probably guessed, this is not the end of the story. Oh no, not even close. Because even though the game was viewed by 16.3 million homes according to the Nielsen ratings, and was the ninth most watched program of the week, the Nielsen ratings, in their stupidity and foolishness and oversight, forgot to take one home into account. Because they forgot to take the Kingdom of God into account with these ratings. Because clearly, there was only one logical explanation for why the Bills lost this game and got destroyed in the process. God hates them. It's that simple. God hates Buffalo. Because after the game, Churches across the Buffalo area were spray-painted with graffiti that utter those three words, God hates Buffalo. Now, no one knows who did it and who was the one to spray-paint this, or whether it was a coordinated effort or a group of people. But many churches in the area were impacted by this, including St. John Baptist Church, St. Paul's Cathedral on Main and Church Street, and Durham Memorial African Methodist Zion Church on Michigan Avenue. When people went to church on Tuesday, 
angry about losing their first game of the season, and just angry in general because it's Tuesday and you're slogging through the work week, they got a message on the church windows and bulletin boards that their Lord and Savior hated them, hated their city, and hated their team. Now obviously, just the premise behind this seems absolutely ridiculous. We'll get to what church leaders had to say in a bit, so I'm not going to steal their thunder with everything. But can we get some perspective here? And I'm not even talking about real-world perspective, because that's for the clergymen to talk about. I'm talking about NFL perspective. This was the first loss of the season. After six weeks, this was their first loss. This game changed nothing. Buffalo was still the number one seed in the AFC after this game. They were still comfortably leading the mediocre AFC East, and they still had the fewest losses in the conference. Plus, no one got hurt, so it's not like you lost someone like Jim Kelly or Thurman Thomas in this game. This was a Buffalo team that had won 19 of its last 23 games in the regular season, winning just under 83% of the time. That was the highest winning percentage in the NFL over the last 23. This was a team that had just made the Super Bowl, something that fans would die for. You really want to give the argument that based on the evidence, God hates Buffalo because of this loss to the Chiefs? That's like if a Patriots fan went up to a Lions fan this season and then to them about their problems, saying that God hates this team. And it's so tough being a Pats fan. In Major League Baseball, the St. Louis Cardinals absolutely stink right now because the geniuses in the front office just decided not to address the pitching in the offseason, despite that being an obvious flaw. But imagine a Cardinals fan going up to an A's fan and saying that God hates the Cardinals. If God even cared about baseball, I can assure you, based on the Cards' success, he doesn't hate St. Louis. So some perspective just from an NFL sense is critical. If this was a fan of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers or the Phoenix Cardinals saying this, I at least get it. But not a Bills fan in 1991. Not a freaking Bills fan. And to the surprise of no one, the church bandit or church tagger or whatever you want to call him was not endorsed by the churches impacted. As just about everyone had the same message. God does not hate Buffalo, and if he did, it's not because of a loss to the Chiefs on Monday Night Football. God has bigger fish to fry. As Reverend Richard G. Stewart of Durham Memorial African Methodist Zion Church said on this, it's obvious that whoever is writing this graffiti, whether a confused adult or foolish child, is simply angry at God because he did not permit the Bills to win a football game. These messages expressed a disappointment in God rather than the church. We are possibly dealing with overzealous adults who think that they know everything there is to know about religion and therefore become judgmental. They break the windows of a church because they do not believe the leaders of that church are doing what they ought to do, or not enough of it. They want to punish the church. The same confused persons think that God has nothing else to do with this time but worry about whether the Bills won a football game. And if they don't, it must be because God hates Buffalo. These persons are trying to use the church to convince us that God doesn't love us because we lost a football game. That is an extreme attitude, and God doesn't do things like that. I would like to believe, and do believe, that God has many more major problems in the world to worry about than who wins or loses any sporting event. I mean, there's nothing more I can add on that. Congregants were reportedly outraged, and Dean Ellen Smith of St. Paul said that he was furious about this, and couldn't understand why someone would write that message outside the church. And while, unfortunately, there's no photos available of the tagging and the damage, there is a photo of George Wands, the parish administrator at Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian Church, posting a message the day after saying that God loves Buffalo. Basically, to sum up this bizarre chain of events, the Bills lose a football game in the regular season that changes nothing on their seating. 
and every church in the city gets wrecked and tagged with a message of God hating Buffalo, leading the church to the outrage. One loss changed Christianity in Buffalo. I definitely did not have that on my bingo card. But here's the bottom line. Whatever you believe in, and whether you believe that God impacts sporting events and pays attention and cares about who wins or loses, I can assure you that if he hated the Bills and hated Buffalo, he would show it in ways that would be way more devastating and heartbreaking than a completely uncontroversial, never in doubt loss to drop the number one seed from 5-0 to 5-1. Then again, maybe Stevie Johnson had the right idea, and the Vandal was two decades too early. Who is to say? But note to self, back in 1991, truly, all of the rowdy friends in the world were here for Monday night, including God himself. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.